Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Это не Земля, это другая планета. Такая же, как Земля, но не догнавшая лет на 800. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me is Ms. Carol Borden. Hi, everybody. Also joining us this week is Mr. Travis Crawford. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Mike. This week we are talking about Hard to Be a God, both the 1989 and 2013 films. Both tell the story of scientists from another world who have come to a planet a few hundred years behind in progress in order to observe and maybe help guide them to a more civilized age. It's kind of like Star Trek Insurrection, but good. Based on a book by the Stugartsky brothers, it's medieval science fiction. Needless to say, there's going to be a lot of spoilers as we talk in detail about these films, so if you don't want either of these films to be ruined, turn us off, watch the movies, come on back, and we'll still be here. Now, Carol, when was the first time that you saw the 2013 Hard to Be a God, and what did you think? The first time I saw it was for this podcast last week. I think it was actually the most visceral film-going experience I've ever had. If ever a film both cried out for, and I'm so glad didn't have smell vision it's hard to be a god. How about you, Travis? I saw it fairly shortly after it premiered at um, the Rome Film Festival in November of 2013. I was not there, but I remember reading reviews of it um, in one of the trade papers, Variety or Screen Daily, something like that and being really fascinated. And also I'd seen one other film by the director, Alexei Gehrman, and uh, was also at that point was very, very interested just in Russian and Eastern European film in general. Um, at that time, I was still handling film acquisitions for the company Artsploitation Films. So I was able, under that guise, to uh, get a screener from Capricci Films, the sales agency. And I, I say under that guise because I knew it was going to be far too unconventional and uncommercial for exploitation to actually want to acquire, but uh, just out of my own personal interest and desire to maybe do something with it. So I was able to see it uh, at home that way. And what'd you think? I was completely knocked out. Uh, much like Carol said, I mean, it was the most visceral experience I'd had viewing a film in a long time. I mean, it's one of those movies that you, you know, rarely stumble across for a, uh, no matter how much you discuss film and write about film, occasionally you see something that is unique beyond any comprehension at the first time you see it. You know, I mean, I can think of other films I would compare it to now. I mean, after having seen it a few times, but, you know, I think there was one review that described it. And I thought this was a very accurate phrase. It's something like a transmission from another planet. Hmm. On a purely cinematic level, you know, it's hard to think of anything. There's sort of no reference points for it the first time you see it. So, yeah, I was very blown away. Although I admit that um, part of me did find it. I know the word, the adjective that gets tossed around to describe that film a lot is 
impenetrable. And that certainly was a quality there that one has to wrestle with. I saw this one, I don't know, maybe about a year ago. I had just been salivating for it for the longest time. I remember seeing some clips out on Vimeo. I'm not sure exactly where it was versus the release, if it was after or before. But I just remember a long time ago, it feels like, seeing little bits of this. And it just looked so beautiful, all shot in black and white. And this whole idea of... A medieval science fiction type film. I mean, I'm a big fan of The Navigator. I like some of the ideas behind things like Alien 3. So the whole idea of mixing uh, this kind of medieval world with science fiction. I was going to say, didn't both of us have the hand of Vincent Ward in them, if I remember? Yes. Okay. Both were Vincent Ward uh, ideas or, or projects, and the whole idea of the, the big wooden planet for Alien 3. I mean, I, I was all for that, the whole idea of monks in space. But So seeing this and just seeing how beautiful it looked and just this idea of these observers coming in and... and maybe they're messing with things, maybe they're not. I mean, it also really appealed to my Star Trek love. So this whole idea of the Prime Directive and all this kind of stuff. So I was like, okay, yeah, let's see this. What I found it to be later on, a three-hour Russian film about this medieval land where these people are there as observers who are kind of living amongst them. And when I finally saw it, I was really just taken aback by it in a good way, especially to the, the use of the subjective camera and just the way that things are framed and the way that it took its time. Some might say it takes too much time, but the way that it took its time to tell a story. Well, speaking of the story, which one of you wants to embark on the unenviable task of summarizing the plot? <laughs> I thought you were going to do it. I was By asking the question, I was hoping that meant I could get out of it. I can try, and you guys chime in when, I'm, when I start to stray. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, great, good. I, I'm really glad I read the book before I watched the movies. You have an advantage over me in that department. I have yet to read the book. I've only read one book by the uh, Strugatsky brothers, I guess is uh, how you say their name in this roadside picnic. I found the Bomashenko translation actually not and not quite lively, but it moves along very well. So the feel of the book is quite different than the feel of the 2013 movie, even though the 2013 movie is far more faithful than the 1989 one. So the movie talks about Don Ramata, who is a nobleman who is also an alien. And he is amongst the people of Ankara, who are, yeah, they're kind of like, it's like, what, 12th, 13th, maybe earlier century Earth, it seems like. And very, very similar as far as some of the dress and some of the weapons and just this idea of, you know, there's no plague at this time, but it definitely feels like one could break out at any moment <laughs> because <laughs> this movie is so dirty and just so it just wallows in the filth. I kept thinking of that that line from uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There's some lovely filth down here, Dennis. You know, and I was just like expecting those peasants to be showing up at any moment. Don Rumata is there observing things and kind of having a hand in some of the local politics. Uh, there is a king. There is also this guy, Don Reba, and Don Reba seems to be kind of the power behind the throne a little bit. And Don Reba is basically doing kind of a purge of all of the, what they call in the, in the movie and in the book I read, bookworms. They're getting rid of all of the intellectuals, the artists, all of these people, rounding them up, and I imagine torturing and or killing them. I believe there are multiple sequences of them being tortured and or drowned in puddles of feces, beaten, this is a recurring... Beaten to death on the street. Yeah. Ramada is trying to basically, like, eke out a little bit of civilization in his corner of the world. He is very concerned with washing and with other silly things like art and culture, music. We start and end the film with him playing an instrument, and throughout the film, I was kind of reminded of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, because every once in a while he'll like play a little tune, and I'm like, okay, that's a familiar song, and only to find out that it was a little classical piece of music. 
he's also looking for one particular intellectual, and that's kind of the the MacGuffin of the movie a little bit. He's looking for this guy named Budak, and throughout the film, he just keeps seeking out this guy. Where can this guy be? And apparently he's very, very crucial, at least to Ramada's interpretation of things, to helping the civilization of Ankara. He is trying to be that person to sneak away any of these intellectuals, these poets, these learned people, and try to save them from the, the hangman's noose and try to make a better world for Ankara, whether they like it or not. Talking about Budok being a MacGuffin, if I'm remembering correctly, in uh, the 2013, the Garman film, he's not in the film much. I think he arrives very late. Yeah, is not a major presence in the story. Yeah, um, false Budok has more time than real Budok. The reason I was asking someone else to um, describe the story, and not just because laziness and fear and I wanted to avoid it, was because I'm curious... As it pertains to the 2013 film, not the 1989 one, how much of the story we have actually just gleaned from writings about the film that we've read and reviews and reviews quoting press kits. And because I see sometimes the same, um, and it, actually you didn't do it just then, which I mean, yours did seem like a genuine reading of the film, but so many reviews I've read. I see some of the same phrases crop up over and over again, which is kind of the key to me that I think people are actually gleaning the plot more from things that have been written about the film rather than what they're deriving from viewing the film itself, which, you know, let's face it, in terms of trying to glean a plot line from a movie, Hard to Be a God is about as difficult as you're going to get, you know, and I think that there are some things that I had just assumed were present within the film itself that when I watched it again today, no, that's not really the case. You know, I think it's more like we're now summarizing background in some cases for anyone that's um, read the novel. You know, they have that advantage. You know, Carol can speak on that um, in terms of what you can bring to it. But with me, there's so much that's not present within the frame, so to speak. Uh, story-wise. I'm trying to think of how long it is into the 2013 version before there's even kind of a mention of anything that would have anything to do with the storyline. I think it's pretty significant. I mean, the first half hour or whatever of that film or, you know, and this would come a lot after, those long handheld takes just sort of surveying squalor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, with little or, little or nothing in terms of dialogue and certainly nothing in terms of plot exposition. It's not an easy film, I should say, to uh, really derive a story from, at least on initial viewing. I actually appreciate that it's not a conventional narrative. But I, I did think while I was watching it, um, I had been telling Mike this earlier, it's, it's not entirely a fair comparison, but it made me think of Wang Jing's Kung Fu Cult Master, which it's not like in any way other than it relies a great deal on the familiarity of the audience with the original book. In assuming his audience's familiarity with the story, he can really embed you in Arcanar and that world and those people and their lives in a very, um, well, like you were saying, like, like you're watching a transmission from an alien planet, which it is, right. r rather than getting wrapped up in a conventional narrative. You know, because whenever you were talking about the Wang Jing film, and I mean, of course, <laughs> You know, anyone um, in a Chinese culture watching, you know, anything that's been adapted from numerous film, numerous stories that have been made into films over and over again, you know, over the decades, The Monkey King or something like that. You know, I mean, there's going to be an advantage that they're going to have that non-Chinese viewers are not going to have. And the Strugatsky brothers are, uh, you know, a cult item in terms of science fiction writers in the U.S. and the U.K., but I gather they're, um, they were very popular writers of genre fiction in Russia. So I wonder how much Gehrman could assume that a general Russian movie-going audience would already know that material. You know, I, mean, I did speak to one friend of mine who, um, you know, when she saw Hard to Be a God in release in Russia, she saw it in a mall, which just, <laughs> you know, I mean, my mind boggles at going to like a multiplex in a mall and seeing Hard to Be a God. But yeah, so I don't know to what extent uh, familiarity would help with the storyline for a Russian audience. I want to talk about the way that the film 
was shot and just that idea of watching this transmission because we are kind of watching the transmission. We have this whole idea of, I think it's on a, a headband for Don Ramata where it is kind of uh, recording and, and transmitting what he is seeing. So we get a lot of kind of POV shots and we kind of get, uh, we get that a little bit more at the beginning. There's some kind of like blurring to the edges of that POV and then that kind of goes away fairly quickly. Not only does that go away, but that um, also harks back to what I was asking about what we bring to the story from knowledge of the material, you know, outside of the text, quote unquote, if you want to say that. In the 2013 version, because they're very explicit about this, more so than they need to be in the 1989 version, but in the 2013 version, is there actually a direct reference to the fact that? Um, they're able to, you know, the uh, people on Earth or the people in the space station are able to view the activities of Don Ramada through, you know, I think in the 1989 version, it's cameras that are actually in his head. So you're literally seeing things through his eyes. Is that actually spelled out in the 2013 one? I don't think it is. Yeah, there's just like hints of stuff in this one, which is very kind of, I don't know if it's frustrating or, or what, but just like even the thing where the one servant of his takes a knife and scrapes it against his shirt and we see a little bit of a spark like it's impenetrable to knives. Right, yeah. Which is one of the very few times that we get anything that could be considered science fiction inside of this world. I think it's one of the only times you can visibly see, I think it's a CGI shot too, if you look closely enough, which is like, you know, I'm sure one of very, very few occasions of that in the film. Yeah. I don't think we get a direct discussion of it being transmitted back to Earth, but we do get a sense that the other characters know about Earth because there's that scene where he and the other observers meet in the river and the other observers want to fight him, which right. is unusual. But that same child servant, as I remember, yells at him about Earth. So he's Don Ramada at this point is just apparently telling everybody, but... I don't think we get anything beyond the structure, the form of the film itself, that these are images being transmitted. Well, one unfortunate thing is that Don Ramada, as the movie goes on, kind of seems to start losing his mind, or at least his grasp on this whole idea of being this observer. I mean, he's not necessarily a passive observer at any point, but as the movie goes on, he seems to get a little bit more and more unhinged, especially as the world around him is collapsing in on him a little bit. What is the difference um, there between the way the morality and ethics of his character is in the 2013 film, um, the type of thing that Mike was just talking about versus his character in the novel? One of the really interesting things about the novel is that the historians who are on the planet studying the different kingdoms, and each of the different kingdoms have a different thing going on, where with this, it's hard to say how much Arcanar's, I'm going to say in the book, the book's terms, authoritarianism is spreading out to the rest of the world. But in the book, what he's struggling with is his colleagues are very stuck on very literal interpretations of historical materialism. So he goes and tells them, I'm seeing this creeping fascism. We need to do something. They're killing off everyone who can read. They're killing off artists and poets. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's normal medieval cruelty. And they tell him that several times because they have uh, what I think they call in the novel base theory or basis theory. But essentially, they think that history is like a natural science and that every human or human-like person and society goes through the same development. And so these people will automatically go from feudalism to capitalism to true communism, which is what future Earth is, where these observers are from. Because they're so convinced of this theory, he can't get through to them that, no, something is terribly wrong until the Greys finish killing off all the intellectuals, except for the ones that Ramada's managed to save. And then the Blacks or the Holy Order come in and kill off the Greys and establish a fascist police state. And then they're like, oh, you're right. And Ramada himself uh, finally snaps because he was in his own way so convinced of his invulnerability that he didn't send his child servant and the woman he loves to Earth like his colleagues had told him to. They keep telling him um, all that we hold dear should be in our heart or on earth. 
and they mean it really literally like we will pick her up and take her away and she won't get killed but they both get killed and that's when he loses his shit and massacres everyone he can get a hold of and they take him back to earth um no i was just wondering because again i haven't read the novel but you contrast the depiction in the 1989 film which um in which he don ramada is very sort of a combination of someone who's a traditionally heroic figure and then someone who, you know, per the theme of the story, is sort of detached from what's going on and, you know, is told not to intervene and that he can't kill anyone or, you know, his violence and actions have to be minimized. And, you know, in Gehrman's film from 2013, um, he seems like he's frequently drunk. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, staggering through most of the scenes. Um he employs casual violence quite regularly, uh, pummeling people. I think there's, isn't there one scene where he sticks his fingers in someone's eyes who's confronting him and then breaks the person's nose, breaks the man's nose? You know, so it's quite a contrast between the way Don Ramon is depicted in the two films. Uh, so yeah. I'm just wondering to what extent it's more faithful, you know, in the newer film. Uh, he, I don't remember him in the novel, Brad bragging about like in the film he brags about how many years he's taken and it's something insane like right. 370 but in the book he talks about how he's a dualist and he has this tension between he's being sort of this swashbuckling noble don who gets into duels and drinks and his job as an observer where he's increasingly upset with his job and he's increasingly upset with what he sees around him and he does start to drink more and one of the things that happens in Arcanar is when they take away the intellectuals and the artists all people do is start drinking and as they get afraid they drink more and he starts letting himself get drunk because they also since they're like super advanced people they have medicine that makes him basically impervious to poison and to alcohol, which is why he can survive the poison that kills the king. Sort of like the book, I, I can't speak to how it is in Russian, but it's he's certainly far more drunk and far more lurching around. One of the things that the narrator tells us in the 2013 version is that he is not allowed to kill. And there is that tension there as far as, you know, he's seeing a lot of horrible things, but he's not allowing himself to kill, or maybe he's being directed by the, the other observers not to. And But I did want to bring out the whole point of there is a narrator to the 2013 film that we don't have. Well, we have the observations of Don Ramada. It's kind of like a close, uh, it's not necessarily a first person, but it's like a close third person for the book narration, at least the version I read. And there is no narration in the 89 version, but this one does have narration. But I have to say that over three hours, the narrator doesn't necessarily show up very much. He kind of sets the scene. <laughs> I, was, I was just about to interject. Well, you're using narrator very liberally there <laughs> yeah. because yeah. I believe we have an opening shot, a wide shot of uh, the, the village or whatever you want to call it, in which there are several lines of narration. And then I could be wrong. By my count, he does not come back again until the 90-minute mark. There's a little more narration right at the midway point, and then more um, a half an hour later, a little more, uh, less than a half hour, about um, an hour and 50, hour and 55 minutes. And uh, yeah, and then a little bit more past that point, but it's by no means doesn't exactly provide you with a regular guide or throughway for the storyline at all. In fact, given the way the narration is imposed over a um, couple of sort of anonymous um, wide shots, landscape type shots, uh, you know, which are rare in the film, you know, the film is very uh, populated by a lot of grotesque close-ups. given their placement in uh, the film. I almost sort of wonder if it was done as a little bit of an afterthought to uh, help provide some sort of context. I mean, I don't want to presume that, but you never know. Right. We never find out who the narrator is, if it's another observer, who it is. And I just kind of want to bring up that he he narrates during a lot of the opening credits, though not all of the opening credits, because those opening credits feel like they go on for probably 20 minutes. Yeah, I, don't know. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's quite a ways into the film. Yeah, <laughs> it's like <laughs> stuff still showing up on screen. I'm like, whoa, I thought I saw the director's name like 20 no, yeah, yeah, it's like no. 10 minutes go by, and then there's a credit for the costume and production design people. Yeah. That kind of goes to the point of the film, though, too. This whole idea of, you know, like 
I don't want to say taking us out of the narrative, but really kind of thrusting us more into the picture. You know, we talked a little bit about the whole idea of these uh, cameras or the camera that Don Ramada is wearing. And yes, we start off with kind of these POV shots from that camera, but then shortly afterwards, the people are just talking to the camera. Like Don Ramada is not necessarily the camera. You know, we will have him either close to the left or close to the right of it. And then he will walk right into frame, leaving people still kind of talking to the camera. And it, it, it's a very interesting way of going about things. And it, it does feel kind of like, I don't know, an ethnographic study of these people, because here we are, we're kind of this, I don't know, Henry David Thoreau, transparent eyeball kind of thing, just there and people are talking to us as if we're part of the action and we are right there with people and there's always stuff hanging in the frame or things coming in and coming out of the frame people sticking arms in or or you know branches or chains or there's ropes hanging from the ceiling and it's just it always feels like we are very very tight on stuff and everything is just very very cluttered so not only do we get this you know the 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 thank God it doesn't have odorama thing that Carol was talking about, but it just feels like we are right in tight and very claustrophobic. And, and maybe it feels like we're privy to a secret, but more than that, it just feels like everything is just shoved into this area and we are right there with these people. Well, interestingly, the aesthetics of the film are very closely aligned with um, the late Alexei German's previous film, um, I hope I don't mispronounce this, uh, Crystal Lift My Car from 1998, which is also shot in black and white and also employs kind of the same approach of a lot of either tracking or handheld shots, moving through large groups of people and a similar kind of, uh, I don't want to say chaotic, but very cramped movement of characters within the frame as the you know subjective camera moves throughout uh, large groups. And again, it's, the cinematography is very similar in both films. Even Crystal of My Car, while it's ostensibly a, a realistic film set in you know, 1953 Stalinist Russia about a surgeon who's being um, sort of persecuted. Uh, and although ostensibly a realist film, it has the same level of grotesquerie and in some cases even fascination with the scatological as Hard to Be God. <laughs> Not to the extent of Hard to Be God, because that would be tough <laughs> to have it to that extent. But, um, but no, there are a lot of similarities to, uh, to the earlier film. Yeah, I think I posted on Facebook that I forget just how many fluids a body can produce until I was watching this movie. I mean, I wrote down in my notes, snot, spit, blood, vomit. That doesn't even talk about shit, semen, piss. Well, I not mean, for there's... nothing is the first, uh, you know, uh, once we move past that uh, sort of wide landscape type shot with the narration at the beginning, the first actual close up of any human being seen in the film is actually of someone's disembodied ass with feces on it, uh, getting ready to be poked by a spear. And then that's quickly followed in the image right after with uh, blood splattered on someone's face and then mud, 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 lots of mud. I can't imagine the misery involved in having to shoot that film under those conditions, let alone on and off for six years and the way they made that film. So, yeah. I know that Gehrman died during production and it was finished by his son uh, and his, and his uh, widow. But I, let me just interject there uh, just because um, I think that that gets reported a little bit more um, dramatically than it should. From what I understand and from what I've read in interviews with um, his widow Svetlana Carmelita and his son Alexei German Jr., uh, the only thing that Gehrman had not finished at the time of his death was the sound mix. So uh, even the edit of the film was actually done, let alone production. From what I read, Gehrman is even, uh, had even approved of the music that was going to be used in the film. So it was really just the audio mix that uh, the son and the widow had to finalize. Not that that's not not that that's minor you know i don't mean to like say that that's you know inconsequential but i just didn't want to give people that it was the impression of that it was kind of like a eyes wide shut scenario however one thinks that movie was finished so yeah god forbid an ai scenario no this was very very much in the can as it were so 
I know that he passed away before the finished product, and I had read that several actors had also passed away before the finished product. So I know that there are probably old people in the background and everything. It's, I think our main characters stick around. They could have cast Budak, you know, like two weeks before they were done shooting, since he finally shows up near the very end. But it definitely was a very long and arduous production, is, is what I'm trying to get to. He um, I, apparently it shot off and on for six years and then was off and on in post-production for seven years. I mean, it's hard to imagine spending 13 years on a film, but I guess for Garman, that was a drop in the bucket considering it was a film that he wanted to make his whole life. I mean, there are thoughts that um, he wanted that to be his debut film. And then I, I guess his first solo film was um, Trail on the Road, which I'm trying to think is like 1971. And then he only other did he only did I believe four films after that on his own. He had also co-directing project as a debut, but he had been trying to make it forever. And um, yeah, I think he originally had it set up to be shot in 1968 in Czechoslovakia, um, and then the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, and the project was put on hold. Ironically, all the exteriors and the castle stuff. And hard to be a god as it stands now uh, were in fact shot in uh, Czech Republic. All those decades mm-hmm. later, although the interiors were shot in St. Petersburg. Uh, I was just thinking about uh, you know the impetus for the Strugatskys to write "Hard to Be a God" was related to the end of the cultural thaw when uh, Khrushchev went to see the modernist exhibit in Moscow in 1962 and hated it. The Strugatskys had been planning on writing their version of the Three Musketeers. And they wanted to do something really swashbuckling and fun with adventure and uh, with this idea that there would be like a communist who was put on a planet that was essentially like either France in that same era or Spain in that same era. And he would spy on the people and there would be adventure. And instead, because of the sudden crackdown on people doing art that wasn't viewed as sufficiently communist in the right way, they made their allegorical science fiction novel. Well, I knew they had uh, sort of a Three Musketeers-like um, original ambitions for the story, which um, is kind of interesting given the tone of the Peter Fleischman-directed 1989 film would almost seem to be a little more aligned with that, even though, of course, Mr. Gossies mm-hmm. hated, that, hated that film uh, when they saw his adaptation of it. Yeah, well, they had given up on it by then. It's one reason to, to read the Bomashenka translation is there's an afterword by Boris Strogatsky talking about writing the novel with his brother. And he talks a lot about how they started out with this fun thing and then how it turned into a criticism of Stalinism. And I think almost everything except for that first film, that co-directed film that we were talking about, that Gehrman directed was set in Stalinist Russia except for Hard to Be a God, which was an allegorical version of Stalinist Russia. Bingo, exactly. Yeah, so I'm sure that that was the element of the, well, one element of the Strugatsky novel that, uh, you know, inspired him and that he really clicked with, I'm sure. When that Baron Pampa character kind of seems like he would be out of that swashbuckling era as well, and he's a lot of fun. He just I love him. <laughs> drinks drinks a lot, has a big-ass sword, and just wants to fight everybody. And worries what the Baroness thinks about him. Yes, the whole time. And I don't think we ever see the Baroness. She's kind of like the Budak of his life. Or Columbo's wife. I got a cousin who wants to buy a pair of shoes just like that. How much do those cost? Should do a hard-to-be-a-god fashion line as a tie <laughs> to the film. You know, it was an opportunity missed. Just thinking about the, the odors that would come off of those must be something fun. I think 30% um, of the dialogue was people saying, it stinks. Yeah, really, I, I can't think of another film. I actually, um, have either of you had uh, experiences recommending the film to others and what their reactions were like? And I ask just because I've recommended the film to quite a few people, a lot of whom have been surprisingly receptive to it for such a difficult, uncompromising film. But I, I do know one woman I recommended it to who... Uh, just said that, uh, no, had to turn it off, couldn't do it. And, you know, I thought it would be because it's three hours long and it's non-narrative practically in a traditional sense of, you know, uh, 
term. And uh, she said, no, I just couldn't deal with all the snot and the shit and the piss and the blood. And, <laughs> you know, it was just like, no, couldn't deal with all the bodily fluids. And I said, oh, okay, well, I can understand that. And it is difficult to think of another film that is that uh, preoccupied with just, like I said, squalor and um, disgust with uh, human beings in terms of both spirituality and physicality equally, I guess. I do have a friend who watched it, and he and his wife now squish each other's faces like they squish each other's face in that. So that was the positive <laughs> thing that they took away from it. That's good. Mike, what kind of feedback have you uh, gotten from anyone that you've shown? This so to? far, none. Okay. So far, none. So we'll see once this episode hits. If Well, I barely ever get any feedback anyway, So, but we'll see if uh, anybody says, yeah, I watched that movie because it was on Netflix and uh, – yeah, this is what I thought. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the film had understandable difficulty picking up distribution in you know, certain territories outside of Russia, the U.S. being one, obviously. Finally found a home with Kino Lorber. But when it was released, I think it was actually the very difficult nature of that movie that was one of the reasons why it sort of did do well. I think, you know, it was sort of like, a badge of courage or a badge of honor that you had seen hard to be a God, you know, because it was, you know, it's like, you know, fans of experimental music who will gravitate towards the most atonal and dissonant free jazz or the most, um, you know, ear shattering Japanese noise music, quote unquote music. And, you know, I think the fact that it was that challenging, you know, a three hour black and white Russian science fiction film with a plot that you could not comfortably describe, you know, a wash in bodily fluids left and right, I think that that kind of helped the film um, develop a name for itself, which is encouraging, I guess. One of the things that I found interesting that I don't remember from the book or from the 89 version is there's a lot of talk about redheads in... Am I the only person that picked up on that, or, 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 or am I dreaming it, or was that actually part of the narrative? I know what you're referring to, and I'm trying to... I thought there was scene like that in the 1989 version, but I might be misremembering it now. Yeah, I don't remember if it was in the 89 one, but I remember it in the 2013. Okay, so it was there in the 2013, because I made a note, and I was like, am I remembering this right? But yeah, they talk about redheads a few times, and I wasn't sure if that was supposed to stand in for something, if it was just kind of this like cultural um, or, or ethnic cleansing that they were trying to do by killing any redheads that they happened upon. But I found that to be kind of interesting, especially since it was shot in black and white. And right, who knows right. who is a redhead anyway? And isn't if, if again, if memory serves, I want to say that Ramada's girlfriend, uh, who might even be his baby mama, uh, is a redhead herself. Yeah, yeah. And they say Ramada is, but they're all afraid of him. And of course, that I got a really strong sense of a witch panic with the redhead stuff. Mm -hmm. That there, right. there was this other normal, well, normal in quotation marks, medieval stuff going on, or stuff that was more analogous to our Earth, with people deciding people with certain physical characteristics are unlucky or evil, and that those were the redheads. I also wonder, too, if it was supposed to stand in for kind of a Jewish thing, just because of all the pogroms that had taken place, both in older Russia and then also during the you know, the Stalinist era, where it was just like, oh, hey, you're a nice Jewish fellow. Let's throw you in a Stalag. Right, right. Yeah. Or a Gulag. Yeah, that's certainly possible. Yeah, that would make sense. Are there other films? We were talking earlier about um, films that may be hard to be a god does remind you of. Uh, you know, and I was saying that the first time I saw it, I really couldn't think of um, any other cinematic cousins to it, not even among uh, Gehrman's work. I mean, you know, when I thought about it later, I saw a lot of the visual similarities to Crystal of My Car. Two films that, well, three films that I did think of uh, after I'd seen the film a couple times, and I'm not sure how familiar you two are with um, any of these. Well, one, I guarantee you probably haven't seen, but I don't know if you know a Russian science fiction film called Kindaza Daza, or can <laughs> yes. Diza? You do know it? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. There, there is an older version, which I think is from what the early '80s, and then there's also a new animated version of it. Oh, really? From um, yeah, from last year or 2014, which I have not seen yet, although I've heard very good things about it. I think it played um, it's played a couple different genre film festivals over time, and uh, but no, the kind of dark humor of Hard to Be a God, and there is dark humor there, which I don't see pointed out in a lot of things that I've read about the film is that 
You know, there are uh, multiple instances of grotesque slapstick in the film. There's a certain tone of humor that reminded me of Kindaza or Kindiza Diza. Um, but then also, I think in terms of um, the way the film is sort of this grotesque odyssey that's just sort of traveling through these various different set pieces, uh, reminded me a bit of Fellini Satyricon. Uh, that was a film I thought of, and also a movie that I know many people have compared Hard to Be God, at least the 2013 version to, is uh, the Andrzej uh, Jawaski film on the Silver Globe, which was his sort of big science fiction project that's recently been... Uh, restored and is uh, screening around. It was at Lincoln Center in New York last month. So those were some of the films I thought of when I was watching Hard to Be a God, again, I should say. Well, I definitely thought of Gil Younger's Black Knight, um, starring Martin Lawrence. Uh, that that came to mind a few times. Uh, also, uh, Terry Gilliam's Jabberwocky actually came to mind a couple times just because of that absurd humor and the grossness of that movie and just the kind of you never know what's going to happen. That movie kind of really freaked me out when I saw it when I was younger because it felt like anybody could die at any moment. Right. Mm -hmm. No comments on the Black Knight thing, really? <laughs> I was just going to let that go, Mike. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I I didn't I haven't seen the film. I didn't know whether you were kidding or you were being serious. I uh, would you like to yeah. elucidate? I would be interested if you had observations. In all seriousness, too, I was reminded of the Michael Crichton film timeline. This whole idea of the observers from our time or these people from our time being thrown back into this just the the whole idea of the danger of this other era which was a, this unenlightened time where science was dangerous and all these kind of things. And that actually, I was reminded of that. I can't say that timeline is a good film by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I was reminded a little bit as far as that, you know, the idea of the time travel, that one was a time travel movie, of course, rather than an observer type film. But yeah, I, I was uh, reminded of it just because of the danger. All right, we're going to take a break and play an interview with Daniel Bird, who directed the History of the Ankenar Massacre extra for the Blu-ray release and possibly the DVD release of this film. And we will play that right after these brief messages. Movies need only three things. Badasses. You tell me who you want done, and I'll do the hell out of it. A chick with drive who don't take no jive. Boobs. Do you know? That the female breast, known to be the source of life since Eve, can be deadly weapons. And body counts. Body count. The mathematics of murder and menace. The BB and BC podcast is your source for exploitation film discussion of B-movies. You can find the show on iTunes and Stitcher Radio by searching for BB and BC Podcast. You can also listen to each episode directly from the show's website located at badassesboobsandbodycounts.com. Let's go to work. Hey. Hello. A little bit of introduction. We are the Film Room Cast. I am Albert Wiltfong. I am Austin Shin. And we talk about movies. We just we talk about anything we like to our heart's content. We talk about everything from the very best films ever made to the very worst. <laughs> and we have scraped the bottom of the barrel on the worst ones. It's it's not what you'd expect either. No, no, no. We are the uh, kind of cast for which Birdemic is a step above some of the stuff we've covered. I hesitate to say this, but the room is a little bit higher than some of the stuff we've covered. But on the other hand, we've also covered stuff like The Godfather, Magnolia. We've covered the very best cinema has to offer, the very worst, so don't try to pigeonhole us. And of course, we like to talk about the hot-button topics. We try not to get too political, but we take a political stance. We're people, we have to. We have a huge backlog. We've been running for about three years. We've got casts on the MPAA, we've got stuff on, like, adaptations, we've got stuff on movies that have been turned into TV shows. 
couple of nostalgia retrospectives looking at things like movie theaters and video stores. Proud of those ones. And we've even got at least one cast on a movie that doesn't exist, so <laughs> got that. Oh yeah, with, uh, with more to come. So that's us. That's us. Uh, so yeah, listen to the film room. I have to credit the backtrack. It is from John Carpenter's album, Lost Themes. I suggest picking up that album. It's a really great album. But yeah, you can find us at thefilmroom.podbean.com or on iTunes if you prefer to subscribe there. We're out there. Yeah. Thank you all. Hope you listen to us. And good night. All right. From page, page to screen. To screen. So they have, and nine times out of ten, they have to send it back to you unopened or just throw it in the garbage can. Things don't always look exactly as we envision our life to look, but sometimes it works out and turns out even better. Gregor Fisher, his bacon number is two because he was uh, appeared with January Jones in Love Actually, and January Jones and Kevin Bacon appeared in X Men First Class together. I've got to say, the very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. Now that. <laughs> it's about the acting, about the writing. That's really what theatre is for me. Probably had more names than uh, than Prince or whatever. <laughs> Never mind. There's a joke for the oldies. Um, oh, be like, who's Prince? Who's oh. he? I'd just like to see uh, Mr. Freeze hiring his bad guys. Going right, okay. So you're a psycho, right? Can you ice skate? Head over to iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher, and put in the search box from page to screen. This is Adam Spiegelman, the host of my second favorite movie podcast called Proudly Resents at ProudlyResents.com. And you are listening to my favorite, the number one, The Projection Booth. Mike put so much work into it. If you listen to my show, I put no work into it. Enjoy the rest of the show, you lucky son of a gun. Daniel, I want to know, how did you come to the works of Aleski Yerman or Hard to Be a God? Which came first for you? Uh, yeah, man. I was in London, May 1998. Uh, at the time, I was a student studying psychology and philosophy at Keele, but I just started kind of working as a, a film programmer. I mean, not in a professional, uh, professional capacity, just basically wanting to screen films, which I thought needed to be screened. And in this case... It was Chwabski films. So I got on the train and went down to London, and I was working with Dominique Hoff uh, on, on the program to have this, this mini thing, which was scheduled for October. But someone had just come from back from the Cannes Film Festival and were describing in the bar this, 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 this film, which they just said was like the worst film they'd ever seen. And they just said it was boring, it had no plot, it was disgusting. It was just basically chaotic. It was totally, everything was like made no sense. It was just like, you know, total madness. And there were people just running out of the cinema. And there was, and, and, and I just, I have to see this movie. It just sounds incredible. <laughs> so the, because basically the person, the person who was describing it to me, you know, I, I really, I, I orientated myself to that against their taste. So the fact that this film was so offensive to them, I knew I'd love it the fact that it really kind of got under the skin and it turned out to be Krustalyov Maschino, the, the uh, Krustalyov My Car, uh, uh, Gehrman's penultimate film. So I got to see that film. I'm trying to remember where I got to see it. I know that I saw it in London in 2001 because they had a small run in London that it didn't have distribution, but the, the Lux Center, uh, which is where, where I was doing the Barovchik season at that time, they, they, they had the film for a, a, about a week and they had like three or four screenings and I remember that was the first time I saw it at the cinema and I was absolutely blown away by it uh, I had no idea what was going on uh, but the the in the court of the Red Czar the, the kind of Montefiore kind of first of what turned out to be two volumes based uh, like a Stalin biography came out and that at the same time and uh, I remember getting a copy of that and that, that filled in some blanks, particularly about the Doctor's plot. But I remember just more than anything being overwhelmed by this this Baroque sense of style, this kind of grotesque humour, and the attention to detail. And I think that that was the... It, it, it's interesting looking back at the time, because I think I do like objects in films, and I think that that's 
one of the, I mean, I like the way what Parajanov does with objects. I like what Barovchik does with objects. And I like what German does with objects. And that's to treat them as kind of like characters or, or you know, and, or as counterpoints to the action. And, and, and I do like these kind of, you know, Buster Keaton's the same. Uh, and Schwankmeyer, but you know the cinema is a, a, a the filmmaker is a prop specialist, and then there were all these stories about how Yemen had spent like years trying to finding the right model cars and you know the right objects and you know and things like this. And I think it it shows whether you've got something uh, the real thing or you know a particular design, the way it's framed and filmed. At that point, uh, I kind of became slightly obsessed with Yemen, and then I managed to get a, a VHS of. Uh, my friend Ivan Lapshin, which had played on TV, the film he made before Crystal of My Car, and that was as amazing, if not more so. Uh, and then a few years later, I was in um, Czech Republic, and I was working on Jure Jakubiska's Bathory, doing about three or four different jobs. And obviously, there's lots of downtime, and the crew were talking about the last time they were at this castle. And the castle we were at was called Tochnik. It's about an hour from Prague. And they were talking about, you know, the, 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 the scene and then this director and his wife. And I, I knew that German was making this uh, film based on Hard to Be a God by the Strugatsky brothers. And then I knew that's exactly what they were talking about. And then I heard all of these horror stories by the crew. And that was the... Bathory was a very difficult experience, but that certainly was one of the highlights to, to, to actually hear from the crew of what it was like when they were shooting the films. And then I was just like waiting for years, years and years and years and asking everyone what's going on and friends in Warsaw and Belarusians who, who were in Petersburg, who, who, who had some sort of connection with Carmel Esther and German. When is this film coming out? That, that kind of uh, took up a good 10 years of just kind of waiting for Hunt to be a god. Yeah, German, his, his filmography is so strange when you see just these years and years between different film projects. Was that more of him trying to find funding, or was he just such a uh, so painstaking when it came to the details of these films that it took him five, six years to make a movie? First, you've got to take into account he only made six movies, five if you discount his first, which he co-directed. And then of those five, three of them were made during the communist period. So there was no question of looking for funds during the communist period. It was just basically whether those projects were approved or not. And uh, so, you know, and of course, he did have lots of problems with the authorities because, you know, th th this idea, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you make a film and then ban it? You know, because it's a lot of money. So basically, usually most films in the in the Soviet system and in the Eastern Bloc, if there was anything problematic about them, they would kind of get put to one side during the writing stage. Really, is it any different from Hollywood now? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're making a film through the studio system, uh, you know, you, you sort of like, if you go to a meeting and pitch to an executive and then they don't go with the pitch and they don't commission a script, you know, that's failure. But if that happened in the in the Soviet system, you know, we oh no, it's 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 oppression. <laughs> sort of, these are heroes, you know. They were challenging, it. so it's it's just double standard. I think the fact that no, so he he did have a lot of problems. So for example, he did try to make Hard to Be God as his first film. You had the the Soviet invasion of Prague in August, and uh, and of course the parallels between that and the story, because effectively it's about communists, probably Russian cosmonauts uh, in a strange planet who uh, are subtly uh, interfering with the affairs. <laughs> you know, it, it was just too too much. So that project kind of got um, shelved for understandable reasons, uh, but obviously incredibly frustrating for Giamman. Then it's a question of basically how do you orientate yourself through this administration, and again, I don't see it any different now, certainly whether it's in England, whether it's in Poland or the US. If you're trying to make a film, what, what, what is the goal? Uh, is the goal to make your film or is it to make a film, i.e. develop your career? For most, most filmmakers, it is to develop a career for a multitude of reasons, for livelihood or because they don't really care or they think they could subvert the system from within. And I'm talking both in the communist system and in the capitalist system. But in the case of German, German was incredibly stubborn. I'm making my film my way or not at all. 
And it was the same, it's the same similar situation with Tarkovsky, a similar situation with Andrzej Jawowski. And, and that's really why those films are on the one hand so few, but on the other hand, they, they, they all are to a certain standard. Uh, there's no commercial film. They would rather the film not happen than compromise. That really is the key. I mean, it is stubbornness and it, it is, a, is a, a, a kind of a conviction and a vision and then basically saying that, no, I will, I will rather than not make a movie than to make a film which is in some way um, interfered or compromised with. And I think that explains why Yemen's filmography is so rich, but also why he only made five films. I mean, he didn't even live to see the completion of the last one, Hard to Be a God. I mean, his son and his wife, Svetlana Karmeleta, finished it off, which wasn't a problem because the film was practically done. It was just some sound issues, uh, and it has a very complicated, by anyone else's standards, kind of sound design and mix. And his son was a, is, a, is a great filmmaker in his own right, one of the most interesting of his own generation. And his, and his wife had been a close collaborator on most of his films, you know, and, and an important dramaturg. So that wasn't a problem. But yeah, he only did five films when he died in his uh, mid-70s. I'm curious about his other films because I've not seen them yet. Do they share that similar style of Hard to Be a God? That whole in-your-face, I mean, the, the camera, the, the use of the almost point of view, but kind of a subjective camera is fascinating to me. It is, and it kind of becomes more and more extreme throughout that filmography. The difference between Hard to Be a God and the rest of his films is that all the other films are set in the Soviet period, with the exception of the first, all of them are kind of, well, no, exception of one, they're, they're all take place during the Stalin period in different periods. So the 30s in the case of my friend Ivan Lapshin, and the early 50s in the case of Cristelli of My Car. But this moving, uh, the, the way this kind of approach towards the camera certainly becomes apparent in um, uh, my friend Ivan Lapshin becomes quite prominent, almost extreme in Cristal of my car, and then it's kind of almost taken to the next level in uh, Hard to Be a God. So yeah, it's definitely an evolution. What were some of those horror stories that you were hearing on the set of Bathory? Bathory in itself was, it was the first film i actually been involved in rather than you know on the outside and it was um completely surrealistic and bizarre so to actually have to be in the thick of this and then people talking within that context about this other situation that was bizarre in itself what they were talking about mainly all focused on the same idea a kind of um, a conviction uh, an attention to detail uh, and an unwillingness to let go or to compromise in the case of Bathory, for example when we needed snow and there was no snow, they got a fire engine to spray foam everywhere. And of course, it looks shit. It looks like a Douglas Sirk movie because basically the floor's wobbling and the, and the snowballs are the size of, uh, I don't know, apples. But in the case of German and, and, and Hard to Be a God, uh, you would simply wait for it to snow. From a production point of view, that mentality, and I'm, that's just one example, but that, that idea that, no, we're going to do it this way. That explains the large production history, uh, the way that the shoot lasted so long and was so spread out. But it was actually that level of perfection and that desire to get things. This is not being a diva, but I think it, it's um, it's just seeing. Uh, and you know, I think it's an example of really treating film as an art, because I mean, it, it is it is a, it is a balance, obviously, between art and commerce. In German's case, it really was kind of like pushing it to in, in a similar way with, with the way that Kubrick was doing. Because on the one hand, yes, the, the film went on for years in terms of shooting, but at the same time, the crew, with the exception of the, the big crowd scenes, uh, was quite compact. So it wasn't, you know, and th these, aren't on, these aren't like Hollywood stars like Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. So it's economically, it's still under control, but it, it is, you know, it is a question. Are you going to push the, the shooting to such an extreme in search of, particular details like real snow, you know, and all the risks that entails. That attention to detail was uh, very much on Gehrman's mind. I mean, not using any car, using the car, you know, not using any prop, using the right props. In this whole business of DVD extras, of which, you know, obviously I, I, I'm a part of, you're kind of used to all these stories about he's a genius, he's a perfectionist and everything else. But, you know, 
let's be honest. I mean, I'm sure like you do. Uh, I always get used to having this as a pinch of salt because there's such a promotional aspect, particularly in contemporary films, because you're selling a product. But, you know, but the, this level of obsession going on with Gaiman, I think, is uh, is pretty unique. What was it about Hard to Be a God that attracted him initially? Uh, well, I think it was uh, Strugatsky's, um, the, the, the two brothers who made this uh, very unusual, at the same time, not that unusual science fiction story, uh, who were very popular in the Soviet Union at the time. very, uh, And not just in the Eastern Bloc as well. They also had a strong following in Germany, so there was an international appeal. But I think that the one interesting aspect of this story, in contrast to his previous films, is that it's almost like, because it takes place in a science fiction context, because this is like a hypothetical world, which is like ours, and it's at a stage which could be described as, you know, it's like the Dark Ages, but it's not the Dark Ages because it's not our planet. It becomes almost like a parable. So in the way that it, he was addressing specific atrocities in a very concrete sense in the films like Lapshin and Crustal of My Car, you know, the, the terrors of the 30s and the, the Doctor's Plot. Here in Hard to Be a God, it, it's, it's like a, it's a parable and it can be applicable both to the crimes of the past. It can be applicable to contemporary crimes in the way that towards the end of his life, German was quite explicit about how the opening scene of the film with the guy taking a shirt was a reference to a comment uh, uh, Putin made about hunting the, the, the kind of the church and terrorists uh, to the shit house. So, you know, it is a science fiction film. It's also about a type of fascism he saw brewing in contemporary Russia. But the other thing which is important is that because he started thinking about the film in the late 60s and ultimately made it long after you know the, the 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 soviet union had collapsed the meaning of the film changed significantly for him and i think it kind of moved more and more away from the novel particularly in its kind of final incarnation one of the factors of course was peter fleischmann's film how that appeared and i think also the other reason was just how uh, the book was written in the communist period and the science fiction kind of conceit is the idea that uh, it takes place in this, this noon universe, this kind of hypothetical world where the communist project is successful. So, because how do you do that after the communist system has collapsed? Do you do something like what, what Ben Wheatley's done in High Rise, which is to kind of go back to the communist period and imagine a future as if it was successful? Or do you do something else? And I think he was very much of the opinion, well, no, we, we, the, it, it's pointless. Those thoughts are now redundant. It's not a question of what if. It's no, no, it's just redundant. So the meaning of the film changed. You know, the, the MacGuffin of the story, in as much as it has one, and certainly the novel, is, is the search for this scientist, Hudak. That's the holy grail. You know, that's the thing to look for. That's, the, that's what's going to solve everything. Whereas actually, you know, in, in the film, when he does find him, the guy's an idiot. And he knows that it's not he's not going to affect anything in Arkana, the city in which the story revolves around. So it's something else, you know, and it, it is something else. I think one of the interesting things with Gehrman's films is his attitude towards plot in the way that I think he consciously sought to basically bury the plot. And it, it becomes apparent in Crust of My Car, but it gets so extreme and hard to be a god, the way that basically, no, film in, in his eyes is not about plot. It's it's a, it's about something else. It's about atmosphere. It's about experience. The plot is just a pretext. It's not a film which can be kind of condensed to a, a pitch or a capsule summary with a moral. That's not the point. That's not why you go to watch Hard to Be a God or a Gammon film, for example. It's everything else. If someone asks me what the film is about, you can actually tell the basic thing of the plot, which is not that apparent. You get the bit at the beginning of the film over the credits when basically it says, this is a planet, it's like Earth, but it's not Earth. And uh, then there are all these problems, all the, all the intellectuals and the, the university is being shut down and killed and blah, 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 and, and everything else. And that. So that's all set up in the credit sequence. And, and then that's, that's it. So there is a plot there, but it is buried. It's, it's literally just like 
put into the, the you know into the earth, which plays a prominent part in the film. To to explain what the film's about, I think that it's easiest just to say it's like a time capsule. It's about literally if you have a time machine, you go into the cinema and then you're stuck in this world, which is like the medieval ages, but it's not, for three hours. Now, you know, the prospect of a non-narrative film is, uh, you know, it's not enticing. But if I ever got the chance to go in a time machine and spend three hours in a, a different planet, I, I would probably remember every detail. I wouldn't understand what's going on. I would try to make sense of what's going on. And I probably couldn't wait to get out of that world and get back to Earth. But I would not forget that experience. And that's very much how I feel about Hard to Be a God. The first time I saw the movie, I, I, I held off. I, you know, I had the possibility. I was working with the German distributor. They'd already decided to get the film. And, and I had agreed to work on, that, work on their desk. They offered me a screener. Uh, and I said, no, I want to see it at the cinema. I wanted to see it at the cinema. I held off. And I... I I went to the London Film Festival and sort of screening there. It was really one of the most impressive experiences I've personally had at the cinema. At the same time, it was infuriating. I didn't know what was going on, but that's not the point. I, I just really felt that this person knows way much more about cinema than I do, which is not, which is, uh, and I mean that in a sincere way, thinking like basically that he's operating at a level of, of everything else, which is just way beyond me. And he must kind of... Uh, do whatever I can to scramble to keep up. And I failed during that particular screening. But one of the incentives and one of the reasons for working on that release, first in Germany and, and with Arrow in the UK, was the opportunity to actually sit down and try to uh, get a handle on it. When you have a release like this and you have to kind of work out, okay, how are you going to present it? How are you going to contextualize it? So for me, I mean, taking on that job and, and, you know, and, and, and asking Arrow to release that film Michael Brook, who co-produced the disc with me, you know, I mean, he 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 agreed and, uh, that it was a fantastic idea, and, and and he also equally thought that Yemen had been completely overlooked in the UK. So I think both Michael and I put forward the case, and Arrow went along with it, and uh, and I think we both had that experience of basically knowing the film is great, but then trying to work out what the hell it's about. Yeah, I was curious how you got that gig and how you decided to approach doing the extras for that. It was Bill Storung in Germany, who I've been working with since 2009. I think they saw the film at the Rotterdam Film Festival. They got the film, but they were incredibly nervous because they realized that on the one hand, the Strugatskis have a following in Germany, but on the other hand, this is a three-hour black and white movie and with not a German language, it's, it's, it's you know, and, and the German dub counts for a lot in the German release. So they were incredibly nervous. But when I saw it, it just made such an impression. And then I, you know, I mentioned it to, to Michael and then I mentioned it to Arrow. And the initial plan, I, I, what had happened is that Arrow said, OK, after the Barofchik box, what next? What do we do next? Yeah, I, I wanted to do a Yemen box because <laughs> that, that for me, I mean, the only reason for doing this is that basically it's to fill in the gaps, you know, because basically, personally, you know, I, I'm not interested in retreading old grounds. Uh, but at the same time, I am interested in, um, for me, it was a problem. It was a problem that Yemen films weren't kind of in distribution in the way that it was a problem for Barovchik's films weren't in distribution. For me, it was important. I kind of got pissed off, to be honest, with this kind of too much love for Tarkovsky. Uh, this kind of, you know, this kind of, why the hell do we give this figure this, this kind of reverential level of love and then Sukurov? And then for me, it was like, okay, Tarkovsky made, for me personally, three or four amazing films. I have a great deal of difficulty watching the last two. I, I also have... I I don't like Stalker as much as some people do, although I still like it. And then Sokorov, I, 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 it's interesting, but I think Yemen is much, 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 much more interesting. So it was like a kind of, a, uh, you know, injustice is too strong a word, but the feeling was that basically, no, look, 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 how can we have this debate? How can we kind of talk about these figures when you have this other character who's a very interesting counterpoint to Tarkovsky? He doesn't have this kind of heavy mysticism which I think, for me personally, makes the last couple of films unpalatable for me personally. Whereas in the case of Gjerman, it, it's much more rooted in a 
a theatrical tradition, a kind of a literary tradition. It's more grotesque and there's more humor. It's much more rabblazing, you know, and, and that, that atmosphere, you know, w- was much more attractive to me personally. And, and I did feel, I have to say, well, okay, you, you need a counterpoint. So that was the reason for doing that. And of course, it was just as it was in Germany. It was a big risk for Arrow to release this film. So basically, Michael and I worked for symbolic budgets, let's say, on with the condition that we had carte blanche to do what we did. And I think that, There was, for me, I saw a very good documentary called Playback by a Swiss guy, Antoine Cartin, who learned Russian and and lived and bought a flat in Petersburg and was around for much of the shooting, both in Prague and in the the Lenfilm studios. It's an excellent documentary, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, if we could have afforded it, that would have gone on the disc and nothing else. As it turned out, as is often the case with these things, it wasn't financially possible so we had to find different ways and then basically so as far as i was concerned with that release one of the stumbling blocks with the version i got to see in london was subtitles you know so it's an echo of the discussion about the devok the way that the subtitles were um not helpful let's say and and it wasn't you know, I, I did some doctoral research and I and I had to learn, learn Cyrillic, but I would definitely in no way I'm I'm not I don't speak Russian, you know, it's just like finding a page, working out which paragraph, working from Google Translate or asking someone to help you translate it. That's my kind of uh, grasp on the language. Nevertheless, it was a case of okay, the priority is is working with native speakers to make this more coherent and accessible and clear and precise just to give because the film is so difficult just to to try and make the dialogue as precise as possible even though it doesn't really it isn't really kind of state the plot explicitly it just tries to make it a bit more clearer so i went um uh, at that particular moment in time i was in warsaw and my old neighbor uh, his wife's belarusian and we have a lot of ukrainian and belarusian friends coming through the flat so we kind of, uh, over a period of four or five weeks, I guess, it was a long time because it's a long film, we kind of went through line by line, doing as best we could to find a, a, a set of subtitles which kind of clarified meanings and reflected the register in which people were speaking, whether it's colloquial or not. In the case, there's a part where they quote uh, Hamlet by Mandelstam, you know, using the proper, you know, using a good translation, let's say, that kind of thing. And that's um, what we set out to do. The other thing which we did, and this was, I saw the film in France, and I spoke to a, uh, a friend who's a, a film historian called Valerie Posner, who, who knew German, and she felt that there were too many subtitles. So one of the things which I noticed then when she said that, I looked back and saw there were a lot of subtitles which basically were on the kind of the, the transcript, which you couldn't really hear, or the way that Guillermo had mixed the film. And he, and he mixes the film in a very specific way, in the way that you hear sometimes snatches of conversation, but you don't hear the whole thing. So in those cases, if you have the subtitles, you get more information from the subtitles than you do from the, the soundtrack. For simplicity's sake, I decided to get rid of a lot of those things which basically native speakers couldn't understand. That was my rule. If a native speaker couldn't make sense of a particular sentence, to get rid of it. That is an important, you know, image is important and everything else. But, yeah, subtitles are important in terms of giving you some sort of handle on what's going on. So that was the priority as far as I was concerned. The other thing was that in the 70s, all of these films were kind of uh, all of these kind of films by like Tarkovsky and Shepetka, you know, all of these kind of Soviet classics from the 70s were distributed by Artificial Eye in its incarnation run by Andy Engel. Andrzej Klimowski, uh, the Polish post artist who, who, who was, um, well, I, yeah, he was born in Eng- he was born in London and um, and at the time, and I, I'd known Andrzej for ages and. Uh, and I, and I thought it would be a way of not reminding people, because I think everyone's forgotten, but basically uh, bringing back that, that to those great posters of the 70s for those the English posters for The Ascent or the English poster for Mirror. So I asked Andre if he could do the cover for Hard to Be a God, and he did a great kind of uh, poster for uh, Hard to Be a God. Sorting out the subtitles, getting a great cover, which could kind of set the tone for the film. And then after that, in terms of the actual content of the extras... I, I was in. I, I went to Berlin 
to film Udo Kier for the, the Dr. Jekyll. And uh, I managed, the, Alexei Gierman Jr. was there to present his film. I, I managed to grab him for a few seconds and it was in a noisy restaurant. But, you know, I, I managed to get about a 10, 15 minute interview with him, which was better than nothing. And then, yeah, I, I just thought, well, okay, the, the best thing to do is to kind of, um, to give for Michael to do an overview of Yemen's kind of career, sort of from the outset to kind of put Hard to Be a God into context. And I just focused on Hard to Be a God. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not a specialist in this area. I, you know, it's just basically following an interest in this particular filmmaker and in this particular project uh, and, and, and just, you know, just doing like a, this is fundamentally film journalism. It, it's a journalistic exercise. That's what we did because we thought that, okay, if you give some context about Guillermo, if you give some context to what he's trying to do, and, and if you make the subtitles as coherent as possible, and if you have a, a poster which really sets the tone for the film, I think all of those elements kind of contribute towards um, uh, the, the, the consumer having the best possible chance of appreciating this movie. When it comes to the history of the Arkanar massacre short that you have on the DVD, is that the first time that you've just kind of turned the camera on yourself and become the expert on the film? To be honest, if I'm really honest, uh, I, I never, ever, ever intended to do that because basically, as far as I was concerned, I thought my, my original concept was it would have two people. One was uh, the um, Russian film historian, uh, Mikhail Yampolsky, who's based in New York. I, I, I think he's really, you know, a, a, an incredible writer. And, uh, you know, it, it's sort of mind-blowing actually reading his books and the way he sees films, the way he introduces films. And, 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 and he'd been working on a book on German. So I thought it's obvious, you know, it has to be Jan Polsky. And I was in New York for the Barofchik retrospective at the Lincoln Center. And my plan was, obviously, to, to film it there and then. But unfortunately, for personal reasons, Jan Polsky had to cancel. So that didn't work out. And then, in, then there was a when I was doing some research, I used to go to Lausanne a lot, to the university, and there was a, a professor there called Leonid Heller, who was a philosopher, but uh, is a philosopher, but had written a lot about science fiction, in particular Soviet science fiction. So I thought he'd be great to talk about the Strugatskis uh, in general, and to kind of you know, although stuff like a lot of some of their books had kind of appeared in translations based on German translations. They'd had some sort of limited take up by the science fiction crowd. I thought it'd be great to get a kind of, a, you know, uh, uh, an authoritative kind of overview of the Strugatskis. I think we arranged to meet in, in, in Warsaw, and then you know he had some sort of problem with his flat. It was just bad luck. So basically, both of the my, my key interviews, with the, you know, I had a, you know, no, practically no budget, and basically I was trying to kind of contrive the two ideal subjects through trips to New York, which was going there for, for Barovchik and then just visiting Warsaw anyway. And those two didn't work out. So it was really out of necessity. I'd never, ever, ever done a two-camera thing. I had to draw a smiley face on a post-it note <laughs> and stick it on a wall to, to make the eye line. And it's an experience I never, ever, ever want to do again. It was absolute hell. I, I really, really cannot say how awful it is editing yourself i don't know and maybe it's a generational thing because i mean you see all these things of like kind of these two camera pieces on youtube and and, and everything else. I, I just for me it was like it was agony it was having a mental image of how you look like and then be confronted with the reality <laughs> over several days and uh, and then basically thinking you idiot why did you ever say that and then thinking and you were saying this to a post-it note stuck to a wall. You know, just thinking, what kind of existence? This isn't a career. This is just like madness. You know, this is just, you know, this is just like the kind of, you know, thing that happens at the end of a Terry Gilliam film and someone's going mad. You know, that's how that particular extra came about. Yeah, financial necessity, uh, two much more preferable kind of interview subjects not uh, being uh, available for unfortunate reasons. But I think, nevertheless, I think the piece does its job. Uh, and I think Michael's piece, is, it's a great, uh, and it's certainly a first in, in that kind of context to actually put Gaiman's work into context from an English 
critic in that kind of perspective. And and it was also wonderful to have those little bits of Svetlana Komolita introducing that French screening. Uh, so I think we scraped by. The, the one frustrating thing was that um, this is on the German release. I was in contact with a American film historian called Ron Holloway. I don't know if you know this guy. For me, he, he was a really interesting character because he was based in Berlin and he'd written books like he had written a book on the Bulgarian cinema and seen all these films, which I don't know how the hell he got to see all these films at, at the time he wrote this book, but he did. I mean, I was really familiar with Ron Holloway's stuff for writing about all this stuff from the 70s and 80s. He made a great documentary on Parajanov. We were in touch and I knew he told me that he'd he he wanted to make a similar documentary on German and, and he'd filmed a long interview on 16 millimeter of German when he visited Berlin with my friend Ivan Latchin, but it had never been finished, never completed. Then Ron died. So I contacted his widow, who's an actress through the German distributor and asking what kind of state the film was in. And fortunately it was, you know, he, he, he'd done a transcript and you know, he, he marked where specific photos and things should go and certain clips should go. But he hadn't got the photographs and obviously he hadn't assembled the clips. We had an agreement whereby we um, reconstruct Ron's kind of documentary. So, yeah, that's on the German release of the film. So that that for me was, you know, again, you know, it's, it's German talking about his life and work. O- OK, it's only up until my friend even Lapshin, but I think it's a great one hour way of getting to know German cinema from German himself. And then on top of that, when uh, Svetlana Kamaleta, she came, she was she was very good. And basically after German died and when the film was finished, she accompanied the film all around the world. And uh, I, I watched her in London and she came to Berlin. And then uh, we filmed some long interviews with, with her after the screening, before the screening, and then during the screening. And those go on to the the German disc as well. So, you know, my, my involvement wasn't exclusively for Arrow. It was kind of between those two, Germany and England. And, you know, as a project, I think of it as one project because, I mean, I, I, it was a, the particular period of time I was working with and uh, it, it was a great way of getting to really know German cinema and uh, and I have a great deal of respect both for German Junior and for Svetlana Komolita. It was also very useful to ask her questions and to get, her answers to some of the points which had always kind of confused or perplexed me about German. So it was a, a great opportunity. I mean, like I said, I do think it's it fundamentally this kind of work, like what we're doing now, it is journalistic. You're looking for a story and you're doing your research and you're synthesizing it into something. On top of that, you're, you're not sometimes like when you get involved actively with the release or with the restoration you become a kind of participant in the story. So, you know, the boundary is a bit blurred, but I think it's all about a worthy cause. And I said, they say the German cinema and hard to be a God is uh, definitely a worthy cause. And I think it's really, the cinema would be much poorer without those films in distribution. We are back, and we were talking about Hard to Be a God. Before it was a three-hour Russian sci-fi effort, it was a two-hour-plus Russian-German sci-fi film from director Peter Fleischman. Now, I've always had kind of a soft spot for Peter Fleischman. His films aren't necessarily that well-known in the United States, and uh, a couple of years ago, somehow I got involved with uh, helping to subtitle the 1974 film that he did called Dorothea's Revenge, and I kind of felt in love with his work after that because I found Dorothea's Revenge to be a lot of fun. I would actually like to cover it on the show sometime, but if you want to talk about absolutely obscure films, that's probably... It's not at the top of the list, but it's pretty darn close. And his other films, such as Weak Spot and The Hamburger Syndrome, Frevel, 
he's got a lot of things that people aren't necessarily talking about. And one of those is this 1989 film version of hard to be a God, which, uh, yeah, even when I brought this up for the, the episode, people are just like, really, there's another version of this. And yes, there was Carol. I want to ask, what did you think of the 1989 version of the film? It's a much more conventional narrative, but what really struck me about it is just how eighties it is. Everyone looked kind of like Christopher Lambert to me. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was wearing that same that wig, wig yeah. that he wore from uh, from Mortal Kombat. Yes, yeah. the Mortal Kombat wig, exactly, yes. <laughs> yes, he was Raiden throughout this, yes. It appeals to an entirely different sensibility for me. Like I, I found it less intellectually enjoyable, but more viscerally enjoyable in the way that conventional adventure narratives are. I did think it was interesting that it deviated both from the 2013 version and the book. I mean, well, obviously it couldn't deviate from the future, but it deviated from the book in that it provided an allegorical message, but it's our allegorical message is any of us could become barbarians at any time if we get contaminated, which is kind of different from things can go fascist if you're not careful and don't watch out for it. Well, I found there to be a moment inside of the translation of Hard to Be a God that I'd read where it does feel like Ramada could become a barbarian. And he kind of like is revel- reveling in this idea of violence and then stops himself, though that really is kind of put by the wayside after that. Yeah. I'm very curious, Travis, as you being kind of this big proponent of the 2013 film, what you thought of the 89 version. Uh, well, first of all, I do think Carol nailed it exactly with the 80s aesthetic of the film. You know, as I was watching it, I was thinking this is less a representation of an alternate Middle Ages that, you know, is evoked in the paintings of Bosch and Bruegel in the 2013 film than it is a post-apocalypse Italian science fiction version of Mad Max <laughs> Beyond Thunderdome. Um, <laughs> so that was troubling for me while I was watching it. Um I didn't care for the 89 version much, although it's regrettable that I only saw it very recently. Um, and I wish that I had had the opportunity to see it and not comparing it to Garman's, you know, film, which I think is a masterpiece. And this is, you know, very much an 80s Euro pudding science fiction film. I found it even more prosaic and leaden in its pacing than uh, the 2013 version, I think because it does approach the story from such a traditional genre perspective. You know, it's very much an action-driven science fiction film, complete with, you know, climactic spaceships and laser beams and explosions and clumsily staged sword fights. But that really kind of highlighted... uh its failings as a piece of storytelling in a way that, you know, obviously that never really bothered me in the 2013 version. Uh, You know, again, I wish I was able to view it on its own terms, divorced from anything else. Now I have to say I didn't, it didn't do much for me and I can understand the Strugatsky brothers uh, Mm -hmm. dislike for the film. While I can completely understand their dislike for the film, I will say that I do have a soft spot for this. And I actually kind of really liked it. And I don't know, is that I had seen this before I saw the 2013 version of it? But I don't know. Just something about it. I don't know if it was those kind of gray fright wigs that the nobles were wearing. I don't know if it was, you know... Werner Herzog showing up for five minutes before he's killed. Yeah, that's that's regrettable. I had I think I have I have to admit I had greater uh, expectations for his role in the film, and he's pretty quickly dispatched. You know, after a few mm-hmm. scenes. So I was kind of hoping he would be Budak in this one, and then it would be such a great thing after at the end of the film when Werner Herzog shows up and they have this big philosophical discussion about... It'd be like Brando coming in at the end of Apocalypse Now. Only <laughs> oh, <murder> her yeah. Song. <laughs> oh, yeah. And just him talking about, you know, what God should be like and just having this great moment. Oh, my goodness sakes. I could just... And, of course, I hear him saying it in English. Right. The, the classic Werner Herzog voice. Yeah. I really felt it could use some Kinski. Just some yeah, random that too. Kinski. Yeah. That would have been wonderful. It's a little mystifying as to why Herzog is even in this. I mean, I don't know if he was doing sort of any type of supporting. You know, when I think of him acting, I you know think of more uh, 
recent English language stuff like, you know, the Harmony Korean film Joy and Donkey Boy and um, what was that? Jack Reacher. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. That's the one I was trying to think of. Other than the fact that, I mean, I guess uh, Peter Fleischman, the director, was one of the, you know, figures in the new German cinema in the 60s and 70s. I know he had a production company with Volker Schlondorf. So presumably they were all kind of from the same environment. And it be the kind of thing where he called him up and asked for a favor. And, you know, Herzog just showed up for a couple of days. But it's it's an odd casting choice, certainly. Maybe, sadly, he was a fan of the novel. Because I think That's what happened with so. me is uh, I watched, I read the book, I watched 89, I watched 2013. And 89 was so not anything that I expected to be watching. Like, I didn't... It, it seemed like something that I could have come across in the 90s on USA Up All Night. Yeah, had it been very clumsily dubbed into English, which I think there is a version out there that is clumsily dubbed into English. I believe you're right, yeah. <laughs> Did you by any chance and, notice who the screenwriter was on the 1989 version? Yes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jean-Claude Carrière is, I mean, one of the big European auteur heavyweight screenwriters all throughout the... Uh, you know, I mean, I guess the 70s, 80s, and beyond, you know, I mean, the Louis Bunuel films, you know, he wrote all that stuff. Um, speaking of uh, Belle du Milky Way, Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, I had, speaking of uh, Volker Schlondorf, he wrote um, the screenplay for Tin Drum. Um, he's still active, I believe he wrote, or co-wrote, um, Philippe Gorel's last film from last year, I'm blanking out of the name of it, In the Shadow of Women. So that's a pretty strange credit right there particularly considering I don't think the screenplay of the 89 version is anything to write home about. They had some amazing landscapes, though. Yeah. It looked gorgeous, though I will say that I was kind of there with you when it comes to this post-apocalyptic thing, especially when he's riding across that landscape during the opening credits and everything. I mean, I could have, expe- you know, I, I was expecting Cherry 2000 to be somewhere in the background or something. So it, I can definitely see where you're coming from with that. All of the uh, front projection stuff out the windshield of the helicopter at the end of the film and the explosions, Golub and Globus wouldn't have even put that in a Canon Pictures production around that same time. I mean, that was not good. Well, it had like three levels of production value, too. It had like the people on the ground in the landscape with the strange mud sculptures and the huge steins and all that. And then it had the adorably handmade model of the space station. And then it had on the space station that almost seemed like sometime between 1968 and 1972. Like it had this weird low budget beauty to me um, where they have the people's heads in front of the screens as they're observing and then later being observed. Well, I wanted to ask both of you, what did you think in terms of the, the one quality of the 1989 version? What did you think of the fact that it does show um, the scenes on the space station and does have, you know, the very futuristic laboratory in which they're all watching the events on the giant screen. And then you do have the cutaways to um, Earth in which I think futuristic decor is represented by plexiglass and a strange looking (laughs) telephone, if I remember correctly. Um, But I mean, what did you think about the fact that at least the film did um, have a more traditional science fiction perspective with those sequences? Did that work for you or not work for you? Yeah, it worked for me. I like this whole idea of the the opening scroll where we talk about the light that was seen in the sky and that it's seen as a uh, you know a sign or something. And it's kind of like no matter how much you try to observe something, you are changing it by observing it. So they have already changed the world by just being there, by their ship showing up. I kind of like that, and I like this whole idea of the the woman who's observing all of these things through Ramada's eyes and just that there seems to be this kind of love between her and Ramada and her watching him with this other woman, actually with a couple other women and uh, just the relationship there between those two characters, between Ramada and this observer. I I found it very interesting and I, I don't know, it appealed to those kind of baser levels of sci-fi that I do enjoy a lot. And of course it's, yes, I agree that the pacing could be a bit better. I was very surprised that it was over two hours long. I think 90 minutes would have been fantastic, but at the same time I was like, all right, yeah, this, this works for me. Obviously it's not nearly as what was the word used impenetrable as the 2013 version. It was much more of an open book, but 
there were a lot of things about that movie that I did enjoy quite a bit. I don't want to dismiss it completely out of hand. I mean, there are things about it that I did like, too. I mean, even lines of dialogue, which kind of hit the nail on the head more than anything in Gehrman's film, you know, the the line in the 89 film, the gods who want to help people always come to a bad end, you know, the fact that uh, they killed all the inventor of the printing press, you know, I, there were there were definitely things about the 89 version that I did like, even when it was comparatively obvious in instances like that. But no, it's it's not a total write-off. And like I said, I wish I'd had the ability to see it, you know, from a new perspective. It's got to be tough for you, having been a fan of the Garman film and having seen it, what, four or five times? Right. I mean, it's got to be very difficult mm-hmm. for you to, to see this 89 version, which could be seen as this really cheap-ass knockoff version of it, which I'm sure that the authors thought that mm-hmm. that it was. But, you know, it, it it has some merit to me, but I could totally see if in a year you go back and you watch it again and you say, no, this was a piece of shit – I'm not going to argue with you. Well, I don't think I would do that. Well, but I can, I'm can. i just saying that I can see where it could be dismissed because it's not necessarily the greatest thing in the world, but it definitely just – it really appealed to me when I watched it. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right about having seen the Garman film so many times and been a champion of that. You know, seeing this now is a little like, you know, seeing Fellini's Eight and a Half and then seeing – a tacky Hollywood movie about a, uh, you know, frustrated person in the industry and, you know, the torment that they're going through, you know, like Terrence Malick's Knight of Cups, for example, seeing something inferior, it's hard to, you know, get your mind outside of that. But I would like to revisit it down the road, certainly. Especially when it says it's the same thing and it's not. I do think it was interesting that they kept the space station scenes because in the novel that Anka person plays a bigger role. And it's interesting to me, th- looking back on the 2013 one, that they, she's not there. At all, right. I mean, no. that's certainly a human no. element in the 89 version that is not present in the 2013 one. Because um, in the book, there's three characters. Two of them are, are observers and one of uh, who are on the planet, and one of them is on the ship, and they train together as children. And then it's bookended at the end when they've sent Ramada back to Earth because he's broken. And, of course, they don't kill, so they don't have the ending of the 1989 one or the, oh, an interpretation of that ending. They just send him back to Earth to heal. I felt so lost when I was reading the book. And I know I didn't read the translation that you read because I had picked up the – I think that was done in 2014. And I think the version that I got was just some sort of – random PDF floating around on the internet somewhere, and it might have been the older translation, it might have been something else. I know that it was formatted fairly well as far as there being paragraph breaks and chapters and all these kind of things, but there were times where I felt like it just felt like I was reading it all as one long sentence at times. So just the whole idea of where am I at in this story felt very difficult. Like I said, there were chapters and everything, but it just felt like it was all running together. And it really was just like, normally I'm a a fairly fast reader and this thing took me weeks to read, you know, just a few pages before I would go to bed and I would just be like, ah, you know, it's really like it was putting me to sleep because it was so difficult for me to get into. So there were a lot of times where like you saying that the, the, the characters that are there in the bookends are also in the book. You know, otherwise, like, I, it took me forever to even realize that Ramada was one of the other characters from the beginning and the end of the book. I was just like, oh, okay. Like, at the very end, when, when they show up again, I was like, wait, are those the same names from the very beginning of the book? <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, it took me a bit to realize they were the same people. But Okay, good, good. Because yeah, I was just like, where where is this stuff coming from? Why, well, you were I'm, having such a hard time. I, I was worried about reading it myself. I'm like, oh, no, it's going to be one of those books. <laughs> if Mike's slogging, oh, man. And then I read it in three days. <laughs> wow. Okay, great. So I think there must be a real difference in the quality of the translation. Like, I don't know that you would like or enjoy it anymore, but I, I really feel like there must be a readability difference. Yeah, I, I think I owe it to myself to track down that new 
interpretation of this, this new translation, because yeah, I was just like, wait a second. So Anton is Ramada. What? Who? What? <laughs> So, and I know I was talking at one point to Daniel Byrd before we did the interview, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I want to reread the book. There's so much more about Hamlet in there." And I was like, "Hamlet? What? I know there's like a little bit of Hamlet in the 2013, but I was like, wait a second, I don't remember there being any Hamlet." He, he does to be or not to be to um, what the novelist? Yeah, oh yeah, he's sitting God. around with the uh, with the artists, and I think the novelist who write, wrote the first novelist on this planet, that the first novel on this planet, and he he starts doing to be or not to be, and then claims it as his own. Wow, I got none of that. So that was another reason why there was such a disconnect for me between the book and the movies, I suppose. Just a heads up, you were introducing um, Daniel's documentary piece and saying it was on the uh, Blu-ray and DVD. Just for the record, that's actually only on the British Blu-ray and DVD. It's not on the American Blu-ray and DVD. So Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sorry. Just the Arrow version of it's it. Just the Arrow one. Yeah, the Arrow one and the Kino Lorber one have uh, somewhat different extras on each one. Yeah, because yeah, he, he brought that up in, in his short film, and I was like, okay, yeah, I, I understand that there's some Hamlet there in the 2013 version, but yeah, I didn't get that from the book at all. So yeah, I feel like, I don't know, like if some sort of maniac tried to translate this or what it was, but man, oh man. Going back to the 2013 one for a minute, did either of you guys notice that it seemed like when Don Ramada did a similar thing? Uh, where he was whispering poetry to one of the other people, that he was speaking Spanish, and then they were translating it, I think, as Hamlet, but I'm not sure. Interesting. I don't recall that off the top of my head, no. no. Uh, I'd be curious to know who, who he was quoting and what piece it was. I want to ask you guys, though, even though here I am talking about how great or how much I like the 1989 film, in the words of Phil Collins, so how does it end? Because I couldn't necessarily understand what was happening with that. Like, they leave his girlfriend on the planet and they just take him away in this version? Is that what I'm supposed to believe? Yes, I believe that's correct. She's unconscious uh, in the aftermath of the battle at the end. And then he is taken up and leaves and she regains consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's the final scene. And then the king, or the prince who is a boy, but he sounds like a girl, at least in the German version that I listened to. <laughs> I don't know if it was if it was just his balls hadn't dropped or what was going on, but he he oh, actually kind of looked like a, a girl to me as well. But anyway, uh, I think he's going to be this hopefully enlightened despot going forward. Mm, yeah, just okay. feudalism. No fascism. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can hope that. I have to say that the guy that played uh, Don Reba w had a great, great look going. Just that he had an interesting wig. Yeah, and I was glad that that the gray wigs were wigs. I was hoping that they weren't trying to play that off as if they were real. This one kind of there was more of a relationship between him and his servants, and this whole idea of uh, you know trying to help out the servants, and especially when he's like. You know, telling them to wash up, and the one servant is just like, you know, oh, you're always telling us to wash, you know, and there's just the whole idea of like nobody believing anything when he's talking about germs and things like that, and just that he can't even like handle some of the food. I, I found to be great, and I was glad that there weren't a whole lot of uh, eating scenes in the 2013 version because I can only imagine how gross that those would would be after a while. Well, as um, uh, as that critic in the Daniel Bird piece pointed out, um, I think the first time we see Don Ramada, he is waking up semi-conscious, probably semi-drunk in front of a huge table full of half-eaten food. But you're right, they don't come back to that particular visual motif very often, thankfully. And the pig butchering, too. Oh, oh the God, pig yeah. The animals are yeah. Yeah. Version, yeah. I'm pretty much totally unfamiliar with Peter Fleischman's other work as a director, so it was interesting to hear you... Um, talking a little bit about your admiration from him because I, for him, because as I was looking up his filmography, um, you know, there were things like the Hamburg syndrome and weak spot that I would, uh, yeah, that I would love to see. I don't know how available they are. Have you ever seen, um, hunting scenes from Bavaria, the 69 one? Yes. 
Yes, that was the one that I was trying to remember. I, I found that one to be... I, I find his work to be even more interesting when he's younger. Weak Spot, I can't say that I like as much, but I've also, I think I've only seen like a French dubbed version of it, if memory serves. Is that the one with uh, Michel Piccoli and Hugo? Yes. Okay, Tognazzi. Okay, now I've not seen that one. I'd be interested in that one. Well, I do have to say this, though, again, in defense of the 1989 version, is that the 2013 version does not end with any kind of rockin' no. song. So, oh my God, I almost with forgot Kurt about Kerr. that. <laughs> Take that, Gehrman. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your Survivor wannabe song? Yeah, he tried a sweet saxophone solo, and it just can't compete. I bought the 45 of the song, and I'm hoping that it shows up before this episode goes up, because I want desperately to end with that. And I want to know what the B-side is. I don't want to sound in any way like I disliked the 1989 one. I enjoyed it tremendously. I had a great deal of fun. And yeah, I think it could be 90 minutes, because it's the kind of movie that should be done in 90 minutes. With dudes in bad wigs and helicopter attacks and guys swinging swords. It actually, <laughs> uh, it actually does, th- that does kind of um, call into question. It makes me wonder for what audience was the film made? You know, the fact that it is a two hour and seven or two hour and eight minute film by a relatively prestigious director from a very prestigious screenwriter from a prestigious book. I don't think they felt like they were making, you know, Warriors of the Wasteland Part 3. You no. know, I think it was probably done as a serious film, um, but obviously, uh, I don't want to say it doesn't work on that level, because I do think there are things that work on that level. Just again, contrasting it to the 2013 version, it couldn't be more different, although I would kind of like to hear the Hard to Be a God theme song put over the end credits of the 2013 version, just for the hell of it. <laughs> well, yes. Grant Stevens, man. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Australian hero, Yes. All right, let's go ahead and take a break and play a preview for next week's show. Kale Azmin Losta Kala Lein Tarda Chipe Kimen Beizer Iches und Pungiavet. Homen, may you macht. Loya Shem, nicht Gott, nicht durch Gott, durch Wemen. Taivo! 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 Kim, ich verschwör dich! Help me! Nehmt ihr mein Guf, nehmt ihr meine Schube, nehmt ihr mein Hochme, nehmt ihr mein Teure, nur gib mir sie, gib mir die Psile, leje Baschano. That's right. We'll be back next week with another foreign language film. If you couldn't tell, that was a clip or preview from The Dibbick. Before we go, I want to thank this week's guest co-hosts, Carol Borden and Travis Crawford. Carol, what kind of good stuff do you have going on over at The Cultural Gutter? One of our screen editors, Beth Watkins, has an impending piece about a Bollywood remake of American Werewolf in London. Keith Allison has a piece up where he searches for America and finds Ham the Space Chimp. And I personally have a short story coming out at Fox Spirit Books called The Lost City of Osiris, and it'll be in the Piercing the Veil anthology. Oh, very cool. 
And where can people go to find out more about you? www.culturalgutter.com. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, at Cultural Gutter, and on Facebook, just look up Cultural Gutter. And Travis, what's been keeping you busy lately, sir? Well, I just finished up a couple things yesterday, a feature article for uh, the Calvert Journal, which is a uh, website out of London that deals with Russian and Eastern European culture. And I did a piece on a new Czech film called I, Olga Hepnarova, uh, and interviewed the two directors of that film, as well as the lead actress, Mikolina Olshanska, and that's going to be going up there sometime next week. And the other thing was I was just interviewed by my friend Bill Ackerman for another podcast uh, that he does for his uh, podcast, Supporting Characters, and that should also so be up in about a week. And other than that, I'm doing film programming work uh, here and there and everywhere. So that's it. Well, very cool. I'll be sure to link over to that uh, Bill Ackerman interview. He's been doing a great job on that Supporting Characters podcast. Indeed, indeed. I've liked his first three episodes very much. All right, guys. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks to everybody for listening. We hope you'll go on over to the website, projection-boot.com, for more information about what you heard today and where you can find out more about the folks we had on the program. You can also find links over there to our Patreon, where you can support the show, and go over to our iTunes page, where you can rate and review. It really helps spread the word to those poor folks who may not know about the projection booth, but should. An almighty presence that dominates your world You could never be happy with everything you got Cut off your emotions with paradise you go Building up your empire with your gold Hard to be a god You fall into a circle that never lets you go Of a hollow empty heart Living in the strangest land Where power shows its soul And now you're looking for a way For all the words to say To show love means a lot Hard to be a God When love has let you go
If you enjoy this show and want more people to know about it, head on over to iTunes, leave a comment, and rate it five stars. Make sure you like and share us on Facebook, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Just search for Christopher Media. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Most importantly, we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you. Christopher Media could not exist without your support. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net, and thank you for listening. Christopher Media, let's make some noise.